surreal. It's, it doesn't sink in for me until these kinds of things take place. When somebody goes, Roger, Batman. And you go, what? Because this is, this is who I see, this is who I am, and I, I, you know, and I, I, I operate when I'm recording in a, in a small box with a microphone, and I try to make sure that the people on the other side of the glass are pleased with what I'm doing for them as my job. And then all of a sudden, like a year later, you go, oh, that's right. Yeah. That was for this. And, and so it's insane. And right from the get-go, both of us were just like thrilled and also kind of going, all right, we want to do this right. Let's make sure we get it right. It's, it's, it's an honor and it's uh, surreal for me. Well, we're both fans, too, uh, and we're both gamers. So we, we understand that we're stepping into uh, a franchise that's one of the highest rated you know, video games of all time. So with that comes an inherent reverence for the characters, for the franchise. And I, my, my initial reaction was to run. I said no to begin with. And fortunately, the people at Warner Brothers Games Montreal that had the, the patience and, and the vision to be able to sit me down and say, let me tell you what we're trying to accomplish here. And it's not that we want you guys to do an impression of Kevin Conroy, an impression mm -hmm. of Mark Hamill, simply because we're operating within the same franchise. But if we wanted to do that, we would just get them. What we want to do is we, we have a unique opportunity to explore a very ambiguous time in, in the Batman mythos, which is this year two, and show a, a younger, more raw, unformed versions of these characters, and then blow up the building. It's uh, that Bane! Was, that was the selling point. Was, was the kaboom. Yeah, exactly. Um, he was like, okay, that, I'm in. That was the sound of my mind being blown. <laughs> um, so once I found out that that's what it was that we were doing, that, that trepidation and fear was replaced with excitement for what we were going to set out to accomplish. I mean, I... I it will, for you, Ben Matt, it I mean, it's just Ben Matt. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, but just to play off of that, I, I, in the early days, as we were doing our casting, and as we are in these early conversations, there were a couple of characters where it was like, okay, well, we can't kind of just get anyone. Um, and and J Batman and, and Joker were kind of those two key characters. We had to get people who understood what we were trying to do, who were passionate about you know, the game, the universe, and, and, and the kind of particular story that we were trying to tell. And so beyond the casting, there were meetings that took place, in particular with these guys. Uh, I didn't actually go to them, but various you know, high-ranking people in the organization had opportunities to sort of sit down with them and have these conversations you know, that, that Troy's mentioning, and then come back to the table and say, they get it. They, they totally get what we're trying to do. They totally get we're not asking them to be you know, a Mark Hamilton, and we're not asking them to try and reinvent the character and do right. something completely different, unlike anything anyone's ever heard from Joker before. But instead, you know, he said it already, everything that he said, he got in those meetings, and so when Ultimately, Troy did say yes. There was definitely the feeling like, okay, good, we found our guy. We don't, we'll never regret it. Wow, uh, that's, that's, I could talk, how long do we have? Because seriously, I could talk for an hour about the cinematic process. Um, we identified cinematics early on as what we, um, at Warner Montreal called a, a needle mover. It, it's, it was an opportunity for us to take something that was already great and, and hopefully bring something new to the table that will be even better, that people will actually point to and say, wow, cinematics in Arkham City were great, cinematics in Arkham Origins are even better. And, and you know, the, you can't do that everywhere, right? We can't take the free flow combat system and go, eh, man, we could definitely throw that thing away. We're gonna right. make something a thousand times better. It's industry class. There's only so much you can do to add on to kind of perfection. But cinematics was an area where we thought, let's, let's invest a lot in this. And it starts from writing a script and goes through a lot of the similar steps that you would find in making a movie, right? You do your storyboarding story and, and yeah. you do your mocking up and you do some sort of pre -vis, not necessarily always with the actors themselves, but some sort of pre-visualization. You bring the script to the recording so that the actors have a sense of something beyond the line that they're actually reading and they're not just like, okay, I'll say this single thing that you want me to say. You've got to help them. Context. We can talk a lot more about that, but give them some sort of context. And then there's a very long sort of post-production process afterwards where even when in engine, we've got something that looks good and sounds good 
you're adding on, you know, the final lighting, the final effects, the final, uh, you know, little details, the little particles of snow, all of the audio cues, you're doing the final music composition, etc. And so in many instances, our cinematics were the first things that we had to finish in the development process because the tail end of them are so, so long. long. Mm -hmm. We had these guys recording lines for cinematics that we couldn't change. Like, that's locked mm -hmm. last, like, October. Yeah, you know, like, literally, like, over a year ago, they were recording some of the lines that you guys are going to be playing in a couple of days because it's a very, very long tail end process. Um, but uh, it, was, it was an area that we, we invested heavily in and there's a lot to our cinematics that we haven't shown yet. There's a lot of spectacle there. So ask me again in a couple of days and we'll, well, we'll talk some more about it. I'll speak to that also just from, uh, to, to toot your horn, if I, if I may. Um, it wasn't just from a, a technical <laughs> standpoint or, um, yes, the production was very, very long, but the cinematics are, are very representative of the, of the the level, or the, the level of standard that, that was set for the game internally for within the team, because it was something that they allowed themselves to iterate on and iterate on and iterate on, um, which is a very dangerous, very expensive thing to do, not just necessarily in, in, in dollars, but also in time and in energy of the team to say, here's our cinematic, but what if we did this and let's make it better and let's chop off this and, and Eric, Eric Holmes, the creative director, said they were monthly uh, what they call uh, baby killing meetings, which is where this is my baby. This I is what I love. Term. It's That's lovely. Fine. You know, it's you a say, wonderful term we too. Have, we have this baby that we've created, and, and who's willing to give this up for the sake of the game, for the betterment of the game? So it wasn't just the post production process, but it was just the commitment that we will not let this game ship until it's not just good enough, but it's the best it can possibly be, or it's perfect. Yeah, we had to be really brutal towards anything that was trending towards being average. Yeah. Anything that was trending towards being average needed, unfortunately, to get a bullet. And so there were <laughs> mechanics, there were cinematics, there were story elements, there were you know, lines, there were whole components of the game that looked like they could be okay, but they weren't gonna be you know, spectacled by our own definitions, and so we needed to go in and take an ax to the game. Technically, it's, it, what's interesting is that I think it was more about, you find a codex for the character, this keystone that you can lock yourself into that helps you to understand the, the character and, and where that character sits in the story is the main thing. Because if the story is, let's say this, the story is very comedic. You don't want to be dark and brooding and everything else. You want to have something that fits within our story. It's not very comedic, but um, you, you, you want to find There's something. a lot of baby that, killing. <laughs> You want to find something that fits within, within the story appropriately. And I, I believe that once you have that, once you understand who the character is, then all of the, the technicalities and, and all of the, the physicalities and everything else will just naturally come out of that. And as opposed to trying to manufacture this performance, it just inherently starts coming out. And a lot of times with that, you'll find something that you couldn't have created. There's something that is just, it, it's happy accidents. And so there was, there was such a commitment to making sure that we had these characters dialed in before we even really started. Mm -hmm. um, so that way, when we're a year forward and we're still recording on the game, that we don't have to come back and try to revisit. We know who these people are. We, we, we've talked about this. They, they both have their own like sort of inherent challenges. Uh, I think, what did I say earlier? Is It's almost the difference of, uh, <clears throat> you know that people are gonna have this reaction of, so who's this guy think he is? Versus, so who's this guy? <laughs> and uh, and, and with, with something as iconic as, as the Batman franchise, um, you know there's a tremendous sense of pressure to get it right, but you also don't get to necessarily try to step so far out of the boundaries of the character to make it your own, yeah. uh, that you're gonna really, you know, define this. Um, but also with a with a character that nobody's ever seen before, what are you gonna do? How do you how do you make this sexy? How do you make it interesting? How do you make it worth watching or playing or whatever it might be? Um, th so they're both not necessarily. It's not as if you get to phone one in over the other. Right. Um, I would I would say that with something this huge, the the challenge for me is to not think about the enormity of it simply because at that point I'm in my head, I'm not doing 
disservice to the character. I'm not doing what I should be doing for my job. Um, and it's, it's, it, there's just less, it's more uncharted territory with an original character, but with this, it's just the tremendous sense of, of pressure to, to, to pay honor to the privilege of getting to do this. And I think that also, you hit on something that's very right. If you're not doing the job, if, if you start thinking about, oh my God, Heath Ledger's done this character. Oh my God, Mark Hamill's done this character. George Clooney. George Clooney has done this character. <laughs> you know, but at the end of the day, you're still just doing the character, and this character lives inside this story. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty, uh, it's pretty self-indulgent and egotistical to think that whatever I am going to do is going to take down the very foundation of the Batman legacy. Mm -hmm. That's 75 years, three quarters of a century that has been built into this. It's going to be fine. <laughs> There's nothing that I can do that can destroy it. At, at, at worst, it'll be forgotten, you know, and, and forgotten quickly. But what I really think that what helps us to be able to stand inside of that institution that is the Batman legacy and, and, and mythology is the commitment to the, the, the telling of the story and that everybody that's on this team, 150 people plus, will, will live and die for this game. Mm -hmm. and, and everyone that's on this team has, has bled for this game. And that's what's going to show up when you guys play it.